Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Nigeria, where satellite images and witness accounts have emerged of what Amnesty International calls the catastrophic destruction from a massacre in northern Nigeria. Hundreds are feared dead after Boko Haram militants attacked Baga and surrounding areas early this month. Before and after images taken of two adjacent towns show thousands of buildings damaged or destroyed. Amnesty says one town was completely wiped off the map. One witness who managed to flee told Amnesty, quote, I don't know how many, but there were bodies everywhere we looked. The Nigerian military has claimed a toll as low as 150, but it could be as high as 2,000. On Thursday, President Obama and British Prime Minister David Cameron issued a joint statement referencing the Boko Haram slaughter, writing, quote, whether we're facing lone fanatics or terrorist organizations such as al-Qaeda, Islamic State or Boko Haram, we will not be cowed by extremists, they said. And speaking in Bulgaria, Secretary of State John Kerry responded to concerns the world's attention. Um, was focused on, Bo on, uh, on Paris. With respect to Boko Haram, let me make it crystal clear. I, I don't know where the silence is. I have spoken out about Boko Haram any number of times, and what they have done with respect to the slaughter recently is a crime against humanity, nothing less. It's an enormously uh, horrendous uh, slaughter of innocent people. And Boko Haram continues to present a serious threat, not just to Nigeria and the region, uh, but uh, to all of our values and to all of our sense of, uh, of uh, responsibility regarding terrorism. Uh, the events of Paris just underscore it. There are different scales, obviously, uh, but Boko Haram is, uh, without question, one of the most uh, evil and threatening uh, terrorist entities on the planet today. Boko Haram is also suspected in a pair of suicide attacks over the weekend, where explosives were strapped to young girls. It was nine months ago that the hashtag Bring Our Girls Home drew the world's attention to the group's abduction of some 270 schoolgirls, most of whom remain unaccounted for. Human Rights Watch spoke to one kidnapped, one woman kidnapped by the group who later escaped. I was forced to go with them on operations. I usually carried their bullets. They would make me lie down on the ground during operations, but I just held the bullets. When they wanted me to kill the first man, my body was shaking and I fell down on the ground. They forced me to get up and watch as they killed the second person. At that point, I was thinking I should grab a gun from the insurgents and kill myself, since they had taught us how to shoot. For more, we're joined by three guests. Adete Akwe is with us, Managing Director of Government Relations for Amnesty International USA. He's in Washington, D.C. Rona Pelagal is with us, Deputy Director of Africa Division for Human Rights Watch. He edited their report, Those Terrible Weeks and Their Camp, Boko Haram Violence Against Women and Girls in Northeast Nigeria. And joining us by the Democracy Now! video stream, Horace Campbell is with us from Syracuse, professor of African-American studies and political science at Syracuse University. He's written extensively on African politics, including the article, The Menace of Boko Haram and Fundamentalism in Nigeria. He's working on a book about U.S. militarism and African independence. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! <clears throat> Let's begin in Washington, D.C., with Adate Akwe. Talk about these maps um, that you've looked at. These before and after maps, and what you think at this point has happened, and how many casualties you believe um, um, there are in northern Nigeria as a result of Boko Haram attacks. Thank, thank you. Um, Amnesty uh, was able to commission uh, satellite imagery that showed uh, Baga and Doran Baga before and after the attacks. Um, Clearly, you can't um, completely um, estimate the, the number of casualties until you actually have physical access, and that, of course, is too dangerous at this point. But the, the level of destruction to the structures um, in Doran Baga, for example, of at least uh, 3,000 
indicate that the number of casualties is probably closer to the 2,000 mark, and certainly um, in the several hundreds, which is a far cry from what the Nigerian government is claiming, um, which is 150, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so what it indicates, I think, is a major uh, escalation in both the, the, the threat of Boko Haram, the, the danger that the people in the northern parts of Nigeria are facing. And it also, I think, brings into very, very stark relief um, the strategy and the response of the Nigerian government, which is not working. Well, uh, uh, what about that response uh, of the government? Your sense from uh, amnesty of what the government and its military is doing to be able to provide some kind of protection to its uh, to the people in the north? Well, the. Uh you know, the, the, the government's uh, statement of 150 casualties follows a pattern of under-representation uh, of the threat and of the casualties going back for several years. Um, one can speculate as to the reasons uh, for that, but the bottom line is that um, people are being killed, people are being displaced. Uh, roughly 500,000, maybe upwards uh, closer to a million, have been internally displaced. Um, institutions like schools, government buildings, obviously military military barracks and other institutions are, have been destroyed. Um, and the, the northern part of the country seems to have been almost um, uh, let go, as, almost as collateral damage, just based on the, the lack of response or certainly what appears to be uh, an, a lack of urgency uh, amongst the political leadership in the rest of the country. And can you link uh, Rona Pelagal of Human Rights Watch, what we're seeing now, this latest attack, and the possibility that um, girls as young as 10 were strapped with explosives uh, to kill others and detonated um, from a remote site, um, to what we've seen in the last years, the girls being abducted? I think they're separate issues, but they're related insofar as they speak to a cycle of violence that goes between the Nigerian security forces and Boko Haram um, with respect to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, for example. As your clip showed, Human Rights Watch interviewed more than 30 girls who had escaped captivity, girls and women who had been abducted and had managed to escape. And we found a range of abuses against them while they were in captivity. Some, um, as as the girl that you showed mentioned, were forced to convert, were forced to marry, were sexually abused and, or, and raped, were forced to engage in labor and serve in military uh, military um, activities. So we know that these girls have been taken in brutal circumstances, they've endured brutal circumstances, and when they get home, there's very little help for them. Um, the Bring Back Our Girls campaign fortunately sh shined a spotlight, shone a spotlight on the girls. But um, they remain, um, we believe, married and dispersed somewhere in the Sambisa forest, um, and it, they, we have not yet seen them return. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Professor Horace Campbell of Syracuse University about the role of American uh, policy uh, in the region. A couple, a few years ago, we saw the uh, too much fanfare, President Obama's uh, uh, support of the overthrow of Gaddafi and the sending of uh, of uh, military support uh, to um, uh, to the Libyan rebels. What's been the impact across northern Africa of the overthrow of Gaddafi? In in terms of the rise and the, the resurgence of, um, uh, of fundamentalist groups. Thank you, Juan. Uh, the statement by the Secretary of State that we're dealing with crimes against humanity behooves everyone in the world to be involved in suppressing and fighting against crimes against humanity. And what we're describing in northern Nigeria and the scale of what has taken place in Baga clearly could not be the work of some um, groups of militias. So we're dealing with many different entities here. And in the specific case of Nigeria, we're dealing with the political struggles for control of the state. So that in the case of Nigeria, we have Boko Haram, or the elements that are called Boko Haram, that are financed from inside the 
top levels of the state apparatus and the intensification of the killings and destabilization of Nigeria at the moment is directly related to the upcoming and forthcoming elections on February the 14th. The um, well-known and the um, Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner for literature, Wally Soinka, presented to the world the fact that there was elements, there were elements of the Central Bank of Nigeria who were financing Boko Haram, and that he had the name of the elements from the Central Bank of Nigeria who were financing Boko Haram. He asked Jonathan to give the names to the world, because he got the names from a foreign embassy. Now, was that foreign embassy the United States government? What is the role of the United States government in the knowledge that they have about Boko Haram? That's the first point I wanted to make. The second point is with John Kerry. What do they know about the role of Chad in Baga and the relationship between Chad and those who are providing missiles and resources to Boko Haram and the destabilization of Nigeria? The last point I want to make is that when there was a vote at the United Nations about Palestine a month ago, John Kerry called the Nigerian government to change its vote about Palestine half an hour before the vote was made. He called Good Luck Jonathan. Clearly, they have information about the compromised leaders in the Nigerian state who are financing Boko Haram. Why do they not bring that information to the African Union, to the United Nations, so that there's an exposure of all of the forces in Chad, in France, in the Cameroon, and in the Nigerian leadership who are financing Boko Haram? That's a very interesting point you raise, the uh, pressure that was put in Nigeria on the U.N. Security Council to vote against um, uh, to vote against Palestine on, on the issue. Um, can you talk more about the U.S.-Nigeria relationship, Nigeria, the most populous African country, and how Boko Haram um, has gained strength there? Nigeria is by far the most dynamic force in Africa. And what everyone fears at the moment is the mobilization of the Nigerian people as the people mobilized in Egypt or the people mobilized in Burkina Faso to remove corrupt elements. So there is a merger of forces of exploitation in Nigeria. Militias are being used against the people. The humiliation, violation, and exploitation of women is reached the most obscene levels. And the accumulation by the Nigerian political class, 40 percent of the oil wealth from Nigeria is siphoned off by that political class. The Boko Haram struggle is a struggle about who will control the billions of dollars, 10,000 barrels of oil per day that is siphoned out of Nigeria. The United States government have the information about bunkering, about export of capital, about financing Boko Haram. The United States government use that information selectively in order to get what they want from the Nigerian government. Now, 40 years ago, the president of Nigeria, Martella Mohammed, was called by Henry Singh Kissinger when the Nigerians supported the Angolans and the Cubans in Southern Africa. And the, the Nigerians were very important at that point to tell Henry Kissinger, go to hell. Martella Mohammed, the president of Nigeria was killed after that because Nigeria was not going along with what the United States want. We need a movement here to expose the collusion between the United States, the oil companies, and the political class who use elements such as Nigeria and Boko Haram to destabilize the Nigerian society.
And uh, in terms of the the, the spread of uh, Boko Haram, do you is it your sense that they are they are gaining support in the population in the north, and there's potential for a possible uh, uh, split of the country between the mostly Muslim north and the Christian south? No, no. Nigerians are too sophisticated for that. What, what, what they fear is an uprising of Nigerian working people, men and women, young people all over the country from north, south, east and west. And so there's an alliance between all of the oppressors in the region, including the United States. What we must ask ourselves is how is it that the former governor of Borna State becomes part of the delegation of the government of Chad when we had this notion that Chad was going to be a mediator, and the government of Nigeria spent millions of dollars to um, organize bringing back the girls, only to find out that elements from within the Chadian government were supplying weapons and missiles to Boko Haram from Sudan. So there is a wide web that we need to penetrate and investigate that we're not dealing simply with some armed, wild-eyed young people. There's a conspiracy against the Nigerian people so that Nigeria is not stable, peaceful, so that the people can have a good quality of life. Anate Akwe, do you share Professor Campbell's analysis on how does this play out in what we are seeing today, the attack on women and girls, the attack on whole communities? Well, I— um I, I think Professor Campbell's analysis uh, goes um, a little bit beyond Amnesty's um, mandate, but I, I think there are a couple of elements there that I, I would have to say are, 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 are very on point. One, I think the threat of regional instability um, is, is clear. Um, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, um, all of those are countries that are now looking at um, perhaps not a, 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 a direct challenge to the whole authority of the state, but certainly the erosion of state—further erosion of state control, and those are all fragile states. Um, I think another uh, point of uh, uh, Dr. Campbell's analysis about the flow of weapons um, is extremely accurate. Um, in addition to the supplies that—or um, the weapons that have come down after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, um, uh, there are also criminal networks that are facilitated facilitating the transfer of weapons. Um, there, there, there's clearly um, credible reports about collusion and support for Boko Haram within the Nigerian military. Um, but there, but and and I think the most important uh, point um, is that there definitely needs to be um, a, a much larger groundswell of pressure on the Nigerian authorities as well as the international community to come up with an an, an effective response to. Boko Haram and what they're doing to the Nigerian people um, in, in the northern part of the country. And Rona Pelago, we just have about a minute left. The issue of the kidnapped girls, uh, w despite all this international attention, uh, no success in locating them. The, does your organization have any sense of what is happening there, and, and it, does anyone know where, where they are? Uh, we actually don't know specifically where they are. Even satellite imagery wouldn't show that. Um, and obviously, a rescue of the girls is very complicated from a number of points of view, um, but primarily because one, one such military response, for example, could endanger the girls themselves. We know that they're with um, insurgents who are heavily armed. Um, and so it is a very difficult situation, but I think it's one that does call for more regional and international cooperation. We want to thank you all for being with us. Rona Pelagal of Human Rights Watch. Chad Atayakwe of Amnesty International and Professor Horace Campbell of Syracuse University. We'll link to all your reports at democracynow.org. Tune in to our Martin Luther King special on Monday. You don't want to miss it. I'm Amy Goodman.